Do you ever just wake up and think, today I would like to be a completely feral little gray gnome? We're all embodying our D&D characters at the table whenever we play. We try to think the way they'd think, and we might even put on a voice or use physical mannerisms to try and bring them to life. But do you ever want to take that a little bit further? Well, taking an idea way further than it needs to be taken is kind of my MO, so naturally I decided to cosplay my D&D character. Hey friends, Ginny D here, and as a person who is both small and angry, it was only a matter of time before I created a really little barbarian. For about a year now, I have been playing Penelope the Deep Gnome Barbarian in an ongoing campaign. It seemed like high time that I bring her to life with a costume, and of course, share her with you guys. Editing Ginny, would you be so kind as to give me a swoosh? Step one, of course, was the design. Back when I first started playing Penelope, I commissioned an artist named Frida Bergholz to design her clothing. I knew I wanted her to have slate gray skin and a gap between her teeth and silvery white hair in pigtail braids, but her clothes were more of a blank spot for me. Since she's a barbarian, she doesn't wear armor, but the conventional leather loincloth and furs type look just didn't seem right for her, so we dug into her backstory to figure out what she'd wear. Penelope exists in my DM Jessie's homebrew world, and she's from an underground agricultural hamlet called Bar Inen. It's a rural farming town where the inhabitants cultivate various fungi as crops, so in short, she's a farm girl. This meant functional layers and a homespun look. After a little back and forth, we came up with this simple dress and apron. There were a few specific details we had to make sure to include. For example, I wanted her to have a hood to protect her from the bright sunlight on the surface. I knew she carried a pouch with dried mushrooms to snack on, and early on in the campaign, a Fearbolg NPC gave her a ring, which she wears as a bracelet. This art would be the guide for the costume, so all I had to do was make it. But instead of talking about my fabric choices and which patterns I used, I thought instead I would let Penelope tell you her own story while we work. Editing Ginny, another whoosh, if you will. Let's do a quick sound check, just talk. Tell me what you had for breakfast. Um, I had a little bread and some kind of soft cheese. Get a little closer to the mic. Like this? Great. Uh, I had found some mushrooms along the trail the day before, so I threw those on too. They were good and spicy, which means I couldn't give any to Ronan even though he loves mushrooms. The spicy ones are poisonous for a lot of people, turns out. Thanks, that's enough. Why don't you introduce yourself? I'm Penelope Mushruckus Blisterblood Merkspore. I know it's a bit of a mouthful. You can just call me Penelope, but not Penny, please. That's just for my mom. You want to talk about your parents? Sure. My mom's name is Whitkin. They call her Blue Bob and she's a tailor. My dad's name was Finch Ramblegig Merkspor. He was a merchant, so he traveled a lot. You're using the past tense. Oh, yeah, he's not dead. I mean, I guess he could be. He left when I was pretty young. My mom got lonely when he was traveling so much. Folks say that while my dad was gone, she started spending a little too much time with the mail carrier. Chug tail toed her nickel plenty. I guess my dad just wasn't sure if I was really his. He left when I was only a few months old. He was just taking a fungus harvest to the city, but he never came back. What do you mean, fungus harvest? Have you heard of Bar Inen? It's a farming town, underground, where I'm from. We grow all kinds of fungus in the stone fields, and then merchants take it through the tunnels to sell it elsewhere. I was usually tilling or weeding with my trusty hoe, Agnes. They didn't really let me harvest the mushrooms because I could be a little careless. That's where I got my nickname. Red Freckle used to say, Mushruckus, your bucket of enthusiasm is overflowing, but your bucket of careful wants filling. Who's Red Freckle? He's a Myconid. A few of them lived and farmed with us. Red Freckle's one of my best friends. Or he was. Before. Before what? One day, Red Freckle and I were working in the stone fields, and the first thing we heard was the screams, or the echoes of screams. It was hard to tell where they were coming from. Then, out of nowhere, this huge monster jumped onto Red Freckle. It was a black blur. It threw him across the field. What was it? It looked like a huge cat, but with too many legs and these awful tentacles. I learned later it's called a displacer beast. I think something had already hurt it because it was limping. At first, I was frozen. I was so scared. But Red Freckle wasn't moving, and it was coming towards him to finish the job. Something inside of me bent or snapped. Next thing I knew, I was on it. It was so much bigger than me. I was tangled up in all of its legs, thrashing. It kept trying to kick me off, but I hung on somehow. Then I remembered Agnes, strapped to my back. I grabbed her and I swung. I hit it as hard as I could, over and over. Agnes was pretty dull from the rocks and the dirt, but 
You don't call me Mush Ruckus for nothing. I went berserk. I don't know if it took seconds or hours. They told me later that they had trouble separating me from its body. Apparently, my arms were stuck in its rib cage up to the shoulders. Ugh, I was covered in blood. I don't like to talk about it. Was Red Freckle okay? Yeah, well, kind of. He's alive, but he'll never work in the stone fields again. And he, well, he started looking at me different. They all did. Different how? They were grateful, of course. Who knows how many would have died if nobody had stopped it, but they were a little scared of me after that. And also, I developed a temper. That didn't help. Little things just started setting me off. That's when people started calling me blister blood, but never to my face. One time I got into a disagreement with another farmer about how to box up a harvest of hanging blue veils and I just lost control. It felt like somebody else took over, like my body wasn't my own. Something happened to my hands. They went black, they had claws. I struck him and... Oh, I knew I had to leave. What if it happened again? What if I hurt Red Freckle or my mom? What did you do? What else could I do? I packed my things. I waited until my mom was asleep and I left. Kind of like your dad did. What? No, nothing like that. Because, because I'm coming back. Once I fix this, once I'm safe. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, how does Frances make all these amazing maps of far off places when she's too chicken to leave her shop and go out into the wild? Well, first of all, that's really rude. I'm not scared, it's just dangerous out there. Maybe you're scared of being safe or reasonable. Anyway, it's not hard with this book. It's called The Creator's Guide to Epic Locations. This is the first volume, The Nature Guide. It covers more than 20 different natural landscapes, from swamps where you could sink into a mud hole and suffocate, to deserts where you could die of dehydration or get lost in a sandstorm or get bitten by a venomous snake. Ugh. Nature. Anyway, part one goes over all the different types of locations and how to create and use them in your game. Part two teaches you how to prep and improvise your own original locations with that information. And part three shows you how to apply all of this to design and create beautiful maps of these terrible, treacherous places so that idiots can come by your maps and then go get themselves killed. <sighs> It's written by Guy Sklanders from the How To Be A Great GM YouTube channel, and Till Lammer, the creator and CEO of the online map making tool Dungeon Fog, and it's on Kickstarter now. If you're the kind of person who never leaves the house, hey, don't look so offended. You called me a chicken first thing. Anyway, this will give you all the tools you need to run great games, tell epic stories, and make amazing maps set in nature without having to actually go outside. Ugh, outside. And now you're what? An adventurer, I guess. I traveled around a little just trying to find somebody or something that could help me understand what was happening to me. And that's when I met the others. Vanya, Juniper, Ronan, and Bermash. Are those your friends? Yeah, but also we're an organization. We're called the Town Council. I think that can sometimes be a little confusing for people. We're all looking for something and it's a little safer to look together. To be honest, I'm not really sure why they let me in. All the rest of them can do magic, which is pretty amazing. A transformation seems pretty magical though. I guess. It doesn't really feel that way to me. I'm getting a little better at harnessing it, but I still have to be careful when something makes me upset. And I think, I think it might be getting worse. What makes you think that? Well, for example, my eyes changed color. Not forever, just when I'm in a rage. A few weeks ago, after we fought this awful thing in the mountains, they turned bright blue, according to Bramash. And then, more recently, I think my arms got longer. Can we not talk about that? Of course, no problem. Anything else you want to say before we wrap up? Can I do a shout out? Sure. Next time you're in Gladmore, make sure to stop by the beer garden. It's the best vegan tavern around. Also, my friend Oli runs it and he's the best. Hey, Oli, if you're watching this, I'm being safe. Well, not really, but don't worry about me. Okay, that's all.
You know, if you can't make a cute, cheerful little gnome girl with a super overdramatic, edgy, violent backstory that traumatized her for life and gave her cool scars, then what is even the point of D&D, right? In a session a few weeks ago, we were attacked by some manticores that really reminded Penelope of the way that Displacer Beast was acting. And at one point, she caught a glimpse of a pair of eyes in the mouth of the manticore, like somebody was inside looking out. I have no idea what that means, but I am very excited to find out. Jesse Jerdak, Penelope's DM, is an internet man himself, so make sure to check him out out on Twitter, he streams on Twitch, he has a YouTube channel. I will put all those links into the description. I enjoyed making this costume a lot because all of it was really straightforward, which meant that I just got to focus on doing a good job and really getting all those details down. There's something super therapeutic about decorative hand stitching, honestly. If you want to learn more about Penelope, tell me in the comments. What do you want? Stories from her game, a deep dive into her character sheet, Penelope responding to my point of view roleplay videos, something else? Let me know. Also, many of you have been asking, and you are correct, calendar season approaches. Penelope will be featured in my annual D&D inspired calendar. We have tentatively assigned her to the month of December. For those of you who are new around here, I make a calendar every year. They go up for pre-order on November 1st. In the past, I have made these sort of campy 50s inspired pinup calendars, but this year we are taking it in a different direction and making a super cinematic fine art calendar that I'm really hoping will bring some inspiring fantasy visuals into your year. So stay tuned for that.